Hi, it's Paul from Wicked Acorn. We're here at St. Martin's Ashinapah Mersey, and uh, hopefully I'm going to meet Reverend Catherine Cleghorn, and she's going to let us in, and we're going to find out where our man's monument is. Hello. Hi. <laughs> so, does anybody remember the name of this bridge? Might that have been a nameplate? There's that beautiful Cheshire sky. We're back at St. Martin's Ashinapah Mersey. We've been exploring the bridges of sail and we're on a little reconnaissance mission to see if we can find the man who gave his name to our bridge. The bridge we're looking at today is White's Bridge or Dr. White's Bridge. And this is a monument, I guess uh, his grave actually. It says, Beneath this marble lieth also the body of Charles White Esquire, member of the Corporation of Surgeons and Fellow of the Royal Society, who after rendering himself eminent in his profession for the space of 60 years, by a dexterity and extent of knowledge scarcely exceeded by any of his contemporaries, retired to the enjoyment of rural and domestic felicity in the society of his family and friends at Sale within this parish. He died on the 20th of February, 1813, aged 84. Some of you may have heard of Dr. White, and it's a little unfortunate that you probably only know him for his connection with the Manchester mummy. Now that's something that'll be covered in part two of this video, and we'll touch on it a little bit here. But Dr. Charles White was so much more than that story. I'm sure it's not what he'd want to be remembered for. Charles White, FRS. Now I had to look that one up. It's the Fellowship of the Royal Society. It's an award granted by the judges of the Royal Society of London to individuals who have made a substantial contribution to the improvements of natural knowledge, including mathematics, engineering science, and medical science. The oldest known scientific academy in continuous existence. It's a significant honor. He's in the company of Isaac Newton, Charles Darwin, and the like. He was born the 4th of October, 1728, the only son of Thomas White, a surgeon and midwife. After being educated, White joined his father's practice as an apprentice in about 1742. So I have to give you some perspective here. America didn't exist as a country. Medically speaking, there were only two kinds of diseases, strong and weak. The treatment alcohol or opium. Bloodletting was still common treatment. Charles White would be dead before the first stethoscope was invented, and that was nothing more than a glorified loo roll. During our visit, a friend of St. Martin's showed up, Celia Bonner, who gave us some information about Dr. Charles White. And I'm... Celia, you know a little bit about our hero today. A little bit, yes. Tell us, do tell. He was one of the founders of Manchester Royal Infirmary and his father and his son were both doctors. And they lived in, had a practice in the centre of Manchester, but they had what they called their country house in Sale. And Charles White actually, um, his sight deteriorated towards the end of his life and he retired and he retired to, um, it was called Sale Priory, but apparently it had never been a priory. And he retired there, and as far as I know, that's where he died. But he worshipped in this church. And that's why there is a memorial, and certainly from what the memorial says, he is actually buried in the church, which at the time, um, you had to be quite posh to be buried in the church. So he was a very eminent physician of the time, and founded Manchester Royal Infirmary. And then after working there for quite a few years, he fell out with the people who were then running it. And he stopped working at the Royal Infirmary and founded another hospital, a leg in hospital, um, i.e. maternity hospital, called St Mary's Hospital. I have a slight connection I have is that I used to work for the National Trust at Quarry Bank. And the family who owned Quarry Bank were uh, the Greggs. And uh, Samuel Gregg founded, built Quarry Bank Mill um, and he and his wife Hannah also lived in King Street at the start of their, of their marriage. 
And I can only assume that Charles White was their family doctor. It made sense as the practice was in that road. The only thing I know for certain is that he delivered Hannah Gregg's first baby in 1790. But she was not impressed with him. She said that Dr. White was hard-hearted, foolish and ignorant. Hard-hearted, foolish and ignorant. And was possibly all right as a surgeon, but not as a physician. <laughs> So I think he knew his job, but had, had no bedside manner. Now, unfortunately, she stopped doing her diary then, so I don't know you know, what the connection was. And then a few years later, they moved up to Quarry Bank. And Peter Holland, who had trained with Charles White, became the physician at Quarry Bank. White was an innovative surgeon who made significant contributions in the field of orthopedics, surgery, and obstetrics. He was a founding member of the Portico Library and the Manchester Literary and Philosophical Society. He presented a paper to the Royal Society in 1760, describing his successful treatment of a fractured arm by reuniting the ends of the bone. He presented another paper on the use of sponges to stop bleeding, methods that are completely taken for granted today, realigning bones so they heal back together, using sponges instead of painful tourniquets, draining abscesses and removing parts of diseased bones where amputation was the accepted practice. The leading surgeon in the removal of kidney and bladder stones. His work in obstetrics was groundbreaking. He insisted on hygienic conditions, regular hand washing, changes of bed linen, towels and sponges and instruments. Although unaware specifically of bacteria, he urged not only scrupulous cleaning, but also separate bed chambers for women in labor. Purpurial fever was one of the leading causes of death for women in childbirth. It was highly contagious, and White's practices all but eliminated it in his hospitals. Something as simple as hand washing and simple hygiene, one of the biggest breakthroughs in medicine, which is usually accredited to Semmelweis, was started by Dr. Charles White here in Manchester. He didn't know how it worked, but he knew it did. He was sort of on track to the theory of evolution. He died nearly 50 years before Darwin's theory, which some people don't accept to this day. Now, I'm a little bit low to point this out, but it is part of his story. He theorized that the races were of different origin and therefore a different species. Today, it's regarded as scientific racism and people have used it as such. However, he did write that his work must never be construed so as to give the smallest countenance to the pernicious practice of enslaving mankind, which he wished to see abolished throughout the world, and that he was opposed to assigning to anyone a superiority over another. Another thought ahead of its time, maybe even our time. There was this guy called John Beswick, and uh, he had, as, as far as they knew, he had died. But at the funeral, just as they were about to nail the coffin down, someone noted his eyelids flickering. And uh, they stopped doing it, and he came around, and he lived for many years afterwards. And he's, oh, yeah, he, he lived for quite a long time after he was assumed to have died. But, but apparently Charles White was, whether he was actually at the funeral or had attended him while he, I don't know quite what had happened. But his sister Hannah was terrified by this story and was terrified that, that she would be buried while she was still alive. And said, so she said that when she died, she put it in her will, that when she died, she wanted her body to remain above ground for a hundred years. Now, obviously, you can't just leave a body lying around. And apparently at this time, it was quite, quite a practice for, for bodies to be embalmed. So Charles White wasn't the only person who did this. But he arranged for her body to be embalmed, and but he then kept it, and it was kept. It was kept in a clock case that was in. He had a museum. I'm not sure where the museum was. But anyway, he had a museum, and then the museum closed, and so he kept it. It was actually kept at uh, Sale Priory, and then. Uh, after Charles White's death, it was taken elsewhere, and I, must, I think it was taken to another museum then. And then eventually, quite a long, uh, in fact, over a hundred years later, um, they felt that maybe time, enough time had elapsed to be absolutely sure 
that <coughs> Hannah was dead, and by arrangement with um, Manchester Cathedral, she was then buried properly. <laughs> it's a fascinating story. <laughs>